Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 289, the Casual Friday edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 19th of May, 2017. Okay, I have Gavin again from Normandy. I can only assume you got kicked out of the deli. No. <laughs> For some strange reason, the signal was very powerful and really good. But when we tried earlier on, it just froze. So I have a dinner appointment with some Christian friends. And I'm in their house using their computer. Uh, and um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a rather odd house, Kevin. Well, it is. I, I'm looking at the architecture behind you. I would say built in the 1920s, probably, uh, maybe 1915. Uh, what's what's remarkable about your house? Well, I, I think first of all, it's probably built in the 1700s, but oh, that's really? an, well, not, a, not from the inside. But go on. <laughs> well, this house uh, we're we're in the middle of Normandy. Mm -hmm. uh, this this house was used by the Gestapo for their headquarters during the Second World War. So it, it's had a kind of atmosphere. But the Christian people who bought it decided that their their prayers and their love and their faith uh, were a match for uh, the, the, the debris that uh, our enemy left in his wake. Uh, I mean, our spiritual enemy rather than our, our nationalistic enemy. So they live here very quickly. And, so uh, hold on. I, I, let me get this straight. Gavin quits as chaplain of the Queen uh quits as uh, church of england priest resurfaces in gestapo headquarters in normandy it does, it does. I, can't, I can't write stuff like that. that's amazing <laughs> it doesn't sound good uh, there are a few in normandy we we almost bought one ourselves there was this interesting uh, gothic looking place with at a very low price near bayeux and we we went to have a look at it and then uh, discovered it was another Gestapo headquarters. So, you know, obviously the Gestapo uh, uh, were around this place. And um, uh, so there, there we are. But but as with all things, Christians are called to redeem and to bring the resurrection of Christ to, to the mess that human beings have left behind. And there is nothing that our Lord can't touch, mend and heal. So mm -hmm. I'm having dinner you know, in the ex-Gestapo headquarters. <laughs> now, <Yeah. laughs> now the yes. The current prayer headquarters. Absolutely. Um, let's talk. I want to do a little follow up. Have we learned anything more about that uh, secret bishop uh, consecration a couple weeks ago? Well, we have, Kevin, and it makes much more sense once you have the information. It, it's such a good idea to be informed before we leap to judgment. Uh, one of the things that, that happened um, uh, uh, some years ago, I think, I think probably about 15 years ago, is that um, there was a curate called Ed Moll who was going to be ordained in Jesmond Parish Church. But at the time, the local bishop, uh, whose name was Wharton, uh, was, had come up from the Diocese of Southwark and was strongly pro-gay. The Parish Church Council of Jesmond had passed a motion saying they insisted <clears throat> on keeping to traditional teaching about sexuality. And so the curate-to-be was hauled before the new bishop, um, the assistant bishop of Newcastle and interviewed and he was told that unless he separated himself from this decision of the church council to uphold Christian teaching the bishop wouldn't ordain him so you'll be pleased to know that Ed refused <laughs> he said good. <laughs> it's just good for him so yeah. the bishop said well no no ordination for you well Jesmond Parish Church has always been a very um, resourceful place so they found another bishop and they who said he would ordain him um, once ordained, you're ordained. Uh, however, the archdeacon of the time caught whiff of this, and um, not having read St. Paul, <laughs> who suggests that Christians shouldn't go to the secular law courts if they have things to work out, they went straight to the secular law court, to the high court in London, and they got out a secular injunction forbidding this bishop to ordain Ed Moll. So it didn't happen. Now, uh, if if you have that in your recent baggage, <laughs> then I think probably one of the things, since this is not a, just a curate, this is um, this is a, an episcopal presence and it's uh, it's functional and symbolic in a very powerful way. 
Um, it's not surprising, I think, they chose not to let uh, the hierarchy of the Church of England know about it in case they would find themselves with yet another secular injunction. And the best way of not telling the hierarchy is not to tell anybody. So um, <laughs> it well, may they did that very well. I mean, yeah, there's no pictures, uh, no press releases, only responses to uh, uh, journalist inquiries. I actually had a person from the church comment on one of the, the Facebook posts or the Anglican Inc. post. So, um, you know, it, we knew this church was likely to be a church that would do things like this. Nobody was surprised that, oh, Jasmine Church did this. Um, it's interesting, though, in, in today's age of mass media, you can use the media to your advantage much easier than you can hide things from the media. Um, that's just been my uh, uh, experience so far. Uh, I did want to make an announcement about Anglican TV for people who uh, uh, don't know. Anglican TV has lots of things we do. We travel around the world. We broadcast uh, events, whether it be Lambeth or Primates Meetings or Global South stuff. Um, here domestically in America, I cover lots of different things. We also do interviews. And uh, a lot of people say, Kevin, you're not doing as many interviews. Well, I, I'm doing more interviews now. But I didn't want to put all the interviews under the Anglican t uh, unscripted moniker. I wanted to separate those. So we're doing something called Anglican Voices or Anglican x -Fox. Um I've recorded two interviews already. The first is going to be Lee Gatiss, uh, Dr. Lee Gatiss of the Church Society in England. Uh, the second is the Reverend Dr. Uh, Stephen Null is going to talk about the anniversary of a book he's published. The third interview is going to be Bishop Hicks, who uh, headed up the uh, ordination task force here in uh, America, uh, and they just published a report last week. And all three interviews are a must-watch. Almost as important as the interview and uh, the correspondent thing I'm doing here right now with Gavin. Um, I just interviewed Lee Gatiss, who wrote a piece kind of responding to stuff you've been doing. You just wrote something responding to his piece. Um, it's all done in, in love, but it shows two trajectories. And we had this in the Episcopal Church. Um, when Catherine Jeffert Shorey was uh, made the presiding bishop and started doing the things she did, which, you know, uh, decimating the church and kicking out the conservatives, um, there was this, a small portion who said, we're never going to leave. We are called to be within the church. There was another uh, contingent that says, we have no choice but to leave. We can't serve Christ any other way uh, except to be out from under uh, this demonic influence over the church. Um, and we've seen this before. Uh, early in the formation of the Episcopal Church, the uh, uh, REC left. And uh, over time, more and more people left the Episcopal Church. Uh, for, uh, different uh, places, uh, different people have left the Church of England, including yourself. You're not the first person to leave. Where do people go now when they want to leave the Church of England? Well, <clears throat> Kevin, I think you've described it very well because at the heart of this, it's about vocation. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're, we're not here to please ourselves, any of us. Uh, we're here to say our prayers and respond to the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's an act of discernment, and sometimes we get it right first time. We usually need each other to uh, check out what we think the Lord is saying to us. But you're quite right. There are some people who are quite clearly called to remain and others were called to leave. But in the situation in, in England, where I guess every church is unique, but, but certainly none of this has ever happened before. I was taught church history by a wonderful Lutheran called Dr. Rudy Heinz, who was an American. And, and he kept on hammering into us, don't leave, don't leave, stay and, stay and fix it if the... Uh, if the Lutherans hadn't left the medieval church, you know, all the reforming zeal might have been ploughed back into it, which is surely what God intended. So I think probably I accept Lee Gatiss's original diagnosis that um, if everything else is equal, one should stay and fight. The problem, as I see it, is that, first of all, quite clearly, some people are called to leave. Uh, I wouldn't have left unless I had felt a very, very big hand in my between my shoulders saying, Gavin, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm an institutional figure. I've been at the heart of the institution forever. It's, it's quite uncomfortable for me being outside the institution. Um, 
So I rather wished that the, the Lord might have said, you can stay, but he didn't. I've been very encouraged by me to meet other people who say, oh my goodness, you have this, this impulsion too. You have to do this, don't you? We had to do it too. And we comfort each other and say, this, this is what the Lord has told us to do. However, Lee is speaking on behalf of those who are called to stay. I think what I differ with him is in my assessment of whether or not they're going to achieve what they think they're going to achieve. Even if Lee was right, and I think he is, um, I think it would take two or three generations to pull the church round from its present trajectory, um, which would be a very long time. And it's certainly true he's looking back to people like J.C. Ryle, uh, important evangelical figures who, uh, who, who took on the church establishment and maintained a witness for orthodox biblical truth. But you can't really say that J.C. Ryle captured the Church of England for Jesus in that way. Uh, he's something of a lone voice. Uh, That's correct. And, uh, and where we are now is at a point of uh, enormous critical um, crossroads. So let's accept that some are called to stay and some are called to go. But there'll be many in, in the middle of that who, who are, if you like, somewhat bereft, bereft of Episcopal leadership, bereft of fellowship who share the same principles of faith, um, bereft too in a, in, in a sea of secularism which uh, assaults their spiritual sensibilities and leaves them exposed and lonely. What can we do for people who are stuck in the middle? And what I think I and several others who are associated with GAFCON are trying to do is to set up, I suppose, a, uh, a parallel jurisdiction, a, a, a separate Episcopal leadership so that people can find um, the right kind of fellowship, the right kind of company, the right kind of Christian environment, so they can continue to discharge their legal obligations where they are, but they can find, if you like, the umbilical cord is removed from an organization which has given up on the authority of Scripture and plugged in somewhere which will provide them with more, um, with more authentic uh, spiritual uh, synergy. Well, my, my first question to you was, where can they go now? If you want to leave, I'm sorry, I hit my mic. Sorry about that, people with headphones. Um, if you leave the Church of England now, there's other choices within England. What are they? It's very difficult to leave the Church of England and go other places. People have done that, of course. So right. the Orthodox, there are more Orthodox worshippers, Eastern Orthodox uh, in England, or as many now as there are Anglicans. A lot of Anglicans have moved into orthodoxy. Uh, and uh, every week I hear of a prominent evangelical American <coughs> who's, who's also moved into the Antiochian or the Greek Orthodox. There are people who've become Roman Catholics. Either One of my best friends as a university chaplain suddenly has popped up as a, parish, a Roman Catholic parish priest in the middle of Chelsea. I used to he was liberal when I knew him, but he's now... <laughs> At the age of 65, he's a full-time parish priest in the centre of London. Others have gone to the ordinaria. Many went to the house churches. Um, those who have, those who felt they had to go have gone. Uh, what we're concerned about now is those who are staying and how, and, and whether or not they can provide, find a kind of dual passport, a dual citizenship. Yes, legally I'm an Anglican. I have legal Anglican responsibilities. I, I answer to my bishop like an administrator. He is an, or she is an administrator. Um, but if you're an Episcopalian particularly, you look to your bishop uh, and your archbishop to, to, to uh, be emblematic of the faith. And so what we're hoping to do, I think, is to provide a, a structure, an Episcopal structure that people can look to, where they get the kind of spiritual covering that, that um, people find it difficult to manage without. And I'm hoping that, GAF, that there, there are a few pieces in the jigsaw. So Gathcon have provided a bishop for AMIE. Uh, we now have a missionary bishop that Jesmond are providing. I'd be surprised if one or two more churches don't do something similar, uh, quoting the Celtic pattern. We have the Free Church of England with two bishops uh, and, and a, a good handful of uh, several dozen parishes uh, at, at the centre. So we're beginning to find, if you like, a convoy, a flotilla of Episcopal and denominational presences that are basically Anglican, providing a different uh, environment, uh, a different fellowship, a different structure, um, so that those who are legally within the Church of England can find a spiritual plug 
that they can be sustained through if that's what they want and need. Now, are we seeing any unity within the, the different breakaway groups? Um, are they saying we can only do this together or does everyone say, hey, we got the best idea, follow us? We're right at the beginning of this process, Kevin, and we have the opportunity of learning from the American experience. <laughs> so we look at what happened when people fled tech uh, and we say to ourselves, it's very important we stay together that um, those with big egos contain them, that uh, those of us with, with the sharp shoulders soften them down a bit. Uh, so all of us know what's required of us. As it happens, we're all rather human, and we're just at the beginning of trying to find a way of collaborating together. But it's so important that if we receive anything from the Holy Spirit, it, it, they are charisms of grace and humility and forgiveness, so that we can bind this this group of Orthodox Christians together into a, into a new, energized, faithful Christian presence who get on. But it's going to be hard. Um, and uh, we're right at the beginning of that process now. It's supposed to be hard, but do keep the uh, Church of England, uh, Gavin, and all the breakaway groups uh, in your prayers as you did for uh, the ACNA and its formation. Um, it's a great way forward. Gavin, I do want to thank you for your time. I hope that we can find you at the cafe again next week. Uh, or, are you, <laughs> or are you heading back to England sometime soon? Uh, no, I'm back in England on Tuesday. So, um, okay, we'll, okay. so, so, so um, I'll see if I can find a pub with the internet. But otherwise, it's my, it's my front room. <laughs> no, your front room is fine. We always have good internet there. Uh, we need to talk to the French. You know, they, they have great wine, wonderful baguettes, uh, some funny musicals. But boy, their internet just is not up to standards. Uh, they're very uh, good. I think what, what, what the French are erratic, uh, and that's part of their charm. You never quite know what's going to happen next. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Uh, thank you so much. I'm Kevin Carlson. Uh, and I'm uh, Gavin Ashenden. Over <laughs> 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 more. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's, it's the 19th of May. God bless you all. <laughs> <laughs>